American death and burial. Most people in North America die either in hospital or at home. When someone dies, arrangements are made with a funeral home to get the body and prepare it for burial. Funeral homes are private businesses. They usually handle most or all aspects of a funeral, except for providing the burial plot. That usually has to be purchased separately. Funeral homes may operate in many kinds of buildings. Old, roomy private homes and new, modern one-level buildings are common types. When the funeral director receives the body, his staff embalms it so it will not decay quickly and will look lifelike at the funeral service. For one or two days before the burial, friends, relatives, and acquaintances are invited to visit the funeral home and pay their respects to the dead person. The deceased person is usually dressed in their best clothes and lying on their back in a coffin. A coffin is a large wooden or metal chest designed to hold the body. Members of the dead person's immediate family usually act as hosts for the funeral home visitation. They greet the mourners and talk to them about the deceased. Usually, there are happy photographs of the dead person near the coffin. Gifts of flowers also surround the coffin. Usually, the mourners are asked to sign a guest book. The funeral service may take place at a church if the deceased person wanted that. Frequently, however, the service is held at a chapel at the funeral home. Attending a funeral is considered a sign of respect, and people will often travel a long distance to attend. Usually, friends and relatives will take a day off work for the occasion. Notices are put in the newspaper for several days before, so that people will know when to come. A minister or priest usually conducts the funeral service. There will be hymns, prayers, and perhaps a sermon, like a regular church service. Sometimes the minister will speak at length about the dead person. Sometimes a member of the family does this. Opportunity is allowed for other people to talk about their memories of the dead person. At the end of the service, the coffin is wheeled out to a waiting car called a hearse, which drives the dead person to the burial place. The mourners go to their cars and follow the hearse to the cemetery. At the cemetery, a hole has already been dug to receive the coffin. Usually, there's a short ceremony at the grave. Sometimes, flowers are put on top of the coffin as it is lowered into the grave. A handful of soil is tossed on the coffin, indicating burial. Usually, the mourners leave before the cemetery workers cover the coffin with earth. Then the mourners may go back to a church hall or restaurant for a meal. A funeral can be quite costly. Even an inexpensive coffin can be several thousand dollars. Sometimes the deceased will be placed in an expensive rental coffin for the visitation and funeral, but buried in a less expensive coffin. Even so, a full funeral rarely costs less than five thousand dollars, and is usually quite a lot more. This does not include the price of the burial plot or the stone grave marker. Sometimes poor people are buried at government expense. It is traditional in North America to bury the whole body in the ground. However, cremation is becoming more popular. The advantage of cremation is that it is less expensive, uses less land, and it appeals to people who don't want an elaborate funeral. Some people may wonder why so much attention is paid to a dead person, but funerals are really for the living. They are a way of saying goodbye to the dead person and receiving mutual support and encouragement from friends and family. Some funeral homes help to organize grief counseling or support groups to grieving family members. Usually, the funeral service is performed in the Christian tradition and refers to the hope of resurrection or rebirth from the dead that Christians believe in. It is now becoming common for people to plan their own funeral service before they die, and usually attempts are made to make the service appropriate to the person who died. This makes it more satisfying and memorable for family and friends. Australian origins. In many countries, leading families proudly trace their ancestors back to some significant group of people. In the USA, prominent families may boast that their family came over on the Mayflower in 1620. In England, ladies and gentlemen are happy to announce that their ancestors came to Britain with William the Conqueror in 1066. In Australia, however, many leading families are reluctant to talk about their origins. In fact, many years ago, one Australian city burned its early records so that no one would know who their ancestors were. 
The reason for that is that Australia began its history as a British penal colony. In 18th century England, there was a large gap between the rich and the poor. To make matters worse, many farmers had been forced off their land by powerful landowners. These homeless people wandered to the cities, where employment was often hard to find. Frequent wars gave temporary employment to young men as soldiers and sailors, but when the war was over, they were no better off than before. As a result, theft was extremely common. To protect themselves, the upper class made theft punishable by hanging. The problem with this was that juries were often reluctant to hang someone for stealing something small and might declare the person not guilty. For example, if a man or woman stole a loaf of bread to feed their children, the jury might just let them go. To prevent this, the courts came up with a new category of punishment: exile or transportation. If the judge or jury was reluctant to sentence the accused to death, they would ship them far away from England across the seas. However, if the person was found back in England again, he or she would be hanged. At first, England sent its convicts to America's 13 colonies. However, when the United States declared its independence in 1776, this was no longer possible. England considered sending criminals to West Africa, but the land and climate were considered unsuitable. So finally, Great Britain decided to use the huge, almost uninhabited country of Australia. At this time, not a single European was living anywhere on the continent. In the fall of 1786, a fleet of English ships began to take convicts on board. This process continued till the sailing date of May 13, 1787. Many British jails had been cleared of both male and female prisoners. Since the convicts were technically under a sentence of death, there was little concern for making them comfortable. At first, the convicts were chained below decks, but later some were released when well out to sea. One man had been sentenced for theft of a winter coat, another for stealing cucumbers from a garden, a third for carrying off a sheep. Among the women, one was guilty of stealing a large cheese, another of taking several yards of cloth. These ships, known as the First Fleet, carried 1,442 convicts, sailors, marines, and officers. The fleet finally arrived at Botany Bay on January 10, 1788. Later that month, they moved down to Sydney Harbour. No preparations whatsoever had been made. The forest came right up to the shore. Soon, the fleet members were cutting down trees and trying to put up tents. It was June 1790 before further supplies arrived from England. Meanwhile, many convicts suffered from sickness, aggravated by the lack of good food. In conclusion, Australians need not be ashamed of their origins. In time, great things were achieved, in spite of the almost complete lack of help from the English government. Many ex-convicts became respectable settlers who began prosperous farms and businesses. The members of the First Fleet, whether convicts or not, deserve to be honoured as the founders of Australia. Charlie Brown. On October second, nineteen fifty, a new comic strip appeared in American newspapers. The hero of the strip was a round-headed kid named Charlie Brown. In the very first cartoon, two young schoolmates watch Charlie Brown walking by, and one comments, "Well, here comes old Charlie Brown. Yes, sir, good old Charlie Brown. How I hate him!" This comic strip was to become one of the most popular in history. Its creator, Charles M. Schultz, drew the strip for fifty years until his death. But reruns of Peanuts still appear regularly in the newspaper. What are some of the characteristics of Charlie Brown and his friends that have made the cartoon popular? Charlie Brown is an unlikely hero. Other kids don't like being around him because the things he does never seem to work out properly. Kids want to be with someone who's good-looking, popular, and successful, so they can feel part of his success. Charlie Brown is always worrying, hardly ever upbeat, afraid of failure, and always making mistakes. His kite gets snagged in the tree. He needs counseling from Lucy. His dog Snoopy is more popular than he is, and the little red-haired girl never notices him. In short, Charlie Brown is a loser. Charlie Brown illustrates all the insecurities that kids have. Many of these anxieties carry over into adult life. Sometimes they reflect problems in the life of the comic strip's creator, Charles M. Schultz. Schultz suffered from depression much of his life and had a difficult time in school. 
He was not very popular with his classmates. Humor and laughter are often a way of dealing with problems, and in the Peanuts strip, the world can laugh at all the silly things that people do. Because of his honest way of dealing with problems, Charlie Brown and his friends are more interesting than the average comic strip characters. The characters represent adult personality types. Charlie Brown is wishy-washy and is afraid to do things for fear of failure. Lucy is a pushy, overbearing female who thinks she knows it all. Linus, her younger brother, is intellectual but insecure. He still clings to his baby blanket for security. Schroeder is preoccupied with Beethoven's music to the exclusion of everything else. Sally, Charlie Brown's younger sister, combines both a romantic attachment to Linus and a desire for material things. Peppermint Patty is a tomboy who loves baseball, but nonetheless has a romantic crush on Charlie Brown. Snoopy, the dog, represents a cool, detached, inventive individual who also relies on basic creature comforts. These characters add up to a human comedy. In the comic strip, we can see ourselves and the people around us making mistakes, getting second chances, but tending to do the same things over again. Behind the humor of Peanuts. Is a serious message. Words can hurt. Relationships are important. Truth is difficult to find. Criticism is too common. Greed can easily overpower us. These messages are both timeless and timely. Peanuts has also been turned into television specials and several movies. Snoopy stuffed toys are popular all over the world. A huge industry has grown from a simple comic strip. Perhaps this means that while we all secretly want to be winners, we really identify more closely with the Charlie Browns of this world. Courier and Ives. Before the widespread use of photography, there was a large market for artistic depictions of scenes and events. A process for making prints called lithography became popular in North America during the early 19th century. One young artist who mastered this technique was Nathaniel Currier, 1813 to 1888. Currier opened his own shop in 1834. Currier's success came when he issued prints of newsworthy events. His ruins of the Merchants Exchange followed a great fire in New York, December 1834. One of Currier's prints of a disastrous fire on a steamboat was published in the New York Sun in 1840. There was also a large market for decorative prints. People who couldn't afford oil paintings would buy color prints to put on their walls. Some of these prints were copies of paintings. Sometimes Currier mentioned his source, and sometimes not. In 1852, James Merritt Ives (1824 to 1895) joined Currier's firm. In 1857, he became Currier's partner. After that, the firm was known as Currier and Ives. Altogether, the firm produced about 7,000 different subjects. Small prints sold for about twenty-five cents, and large color prints for about three dollars. Traveling salesmen went from house to house selling them. Courier and Ives sometimes hired the original painters to make the print. More often, someone from their own studio either composed an original subject or copied an existing painting or drawing. Contemporary news remained popular. Courier and Ives' prints included the first appearance of Jenny Lind in America, eighteen fifty, the fall of Richmond, Virginia, eighteen sixty-five. And the Great Fire at Chicago, 1871. A common subject was a patriotic scene from American history. Interesting occupations such as whaling, bird hunting, trapping, fur trading, and deep sea fishing were portrayed. Pioneer and Indian topics were in demand. However, the most popular of all scenes were winter and holiday prints of ordinary people enjoying life: farm scenes, buggy rides, sleigh rides, market scenes, blacksmith shops. And town scenes sold well. Favorite prints included American Forest Scene, Maple Sugaring, 1860; Home to Thanksgiving, 1863; Winter in the Country, 1862; Life in the Country, The Morning Ride, 1859; and American Winter Sports, 1856. These scenes are still popular. Even today, you can buy Christmas cards with Courier and Ives winter scenes. This collection of prints gives a remarkable picture of America between 1934 and 1907. Although the prints are sometimes more romantic than reality, they give a lot of information about everyday life. They depict styles of clothing, trains and boats, buildings and bridges, and popular activities. 
They also tell us what sorts of scenes people at that time liked and what their artistic tastes were. Eventually, advances in photography made this kind of printmaking obsolete. In 1906, the firm of Courier and Ives closed its doors. For a while, these prints were not considered very valuable. Nowadays, however, there are many collectors, and Courier and Ives prints once again can be found decorating North American homes. Dr. Norman Bethune. Some people find their vocation early in life; others do not discover their life's work until they are older. Norman Bethune tried many things before he fully recognized his true work. Bethune was born in Gravenhurst, Ontario, in 1890. He was the son of a Presbyterian clergyman. The family moved frequently, and many of the places they lived were close to lakes, rivers, and woods. As a young man, Norman loved the outdoors. He became a good swimmer and skater. He also showed that he had a strong, independent streak. He hated rules, but also had a strong sense of justice. The young man studied science at the University of Toronto from 1909 to 1911. After that, he worked for Frontier College. This was a volunteer organization where instructors did the same jobs as local workers during the day and taught them English in the evening. He then returned to Toronto to study medicine. Early in World War One, he joined the Army Medical Corps. He reached France in February 1915, but was wounded in April and eventually returned to Canada. He went back to the war in 1917. At the end of the war, he continued to study medicine in London, England. While he was in England, he married a Scottish woman, Frances Campbell Penny. Although Bethune loved her very much, their marriage ended in divorce in 1927. The couple moved to Detroit, Michigan, in 1924, where Bethune opened a medical practice. In the middle of his growing success, he contracted tuberculosis. This was a low point in Bethune's life. Thinking that he was going to die, he considered suicide. One day, however, he read of a new treatment for tuberculosis and insisted that his doctors perform the operation on him. As a result, Bethune recovered. The year was 1927. For some years after, Bethune devoted himself to the treatment of tuberculosis patients. However, he began to notice a pattern: rich patients who could afford proper medical care usually recovered; poor patients usually died. Bethune became a supporter of government-funded medical care. Bethune admired the government-funded health system in communist Russia. He was angry when Canada would not support his idea about Medicare. Bethune wanted to change the world, and communism seemed like the most promising method. In 1936, Bethune went to Spain to help the Republicans fight the fascists. He was appalled to see the fascists' allies, Germany and Italy, dropping bombs on women and children. He developed a hatred for fascism. He also decided that doctors should go to the front rather than wait for the wounded to be brought to them. In Spain, he developed a blood transfusion service, which saved many lives. Returning to North America, Bethune heard about the Japanese attack on China in 1937. Early in 1938, he sailed for China. Bethune had joined the Communist Party. Now he went to join the army of Mao Zedong in northern China. Mo's army was suffering badly from Japanese attacks. They had hardly any doctors or medical supplies. Difficulties only made Bethune work harder. He soon organized a hospital, trained medical workers, and wrote textbooks. He insisted on operating right at the front to give the wounded a better chance of survival. He went for days without sleep and gave his own blood to help the wounded. In November 1939, he died from blood poisoning, but his work lived on. In 1973, the Canadian government bought his house that he was born in and turned it into a museum. Etiquette. Etiquette is a French word. The original meaning was little tickets. These tickets were given to people who were attending a public ceremony. Printed on the ticket were instructions about how to behave on this occasion. So etiquette came to mean the way to behave on public occasions. Etiquette today includes how to introduce people. How to eat properly, how to dress for different occasions, how to speak to different people, and what to do on special occasions. Almost every part of social life can have its particular etiquette. Sometimes etiquette changes or seems to change. There was much behavior attached to courtship, such as a man holding the door open for a woman. Nowadays, some people find this outdated, but politeness is always a good idea. 
it is nice to hold the door open for the next person, whoever they are. In fact, it sometimes seems like contemporary life encourages bad manners. Etiquette is no longer taught to young people. Moreover, in a youth culture, young people take their examples from other young people. As a result, good manners aren't considered important. The point of etiquette is to help people to get along with each other. If people behave in an accepted manner, there is less chance of misunderstanding. It is important for people to think about treating other people well. If everyone does what they feel like doing, it doesn't seem like they respect other people. Etiquette can help things to go a lot smoother. Manners vary from culture to culture, but the intention is the same: to treat people with consideration. This is a way to reduce conflict. Sometimes we can understand where these customs come from. Originally, shaking hands with your right hand probably meant that you weren't carrying a weapon. Taking off your hat may originally have been taking off your helmet. This meant that you weren't going to fight. Nowadays, there are new areas of social life. For example, a lot of conversation now takes place on the telephone. Perhaps because there is no traditional telephone etiquette, some people feel free to be rude. Try to treat the person on the phone just the way you would treat them if you were actually talking to them. Most people feel it is rude to interrupt a conversation, but many people seem to think that it is okay to interrupt someone talking on the phone. Children especially need to be taught not to interrupt. The internet also needs its own etiquette or netiquette, because you cannot see whom you are talking to, and they may be thousands of miles away. It is easy to misunderstand. Also, people cannot hear the tone of your voice over the internet. For this reason, some people use smileys, little faces, to show how they are feeling. If they make a joke, they can use a smiling face or print grin after their remark. This tips off the recipient that their remark is not to be taken seriously. Using simple words like "please" and "thank you" can make everyday life a lot smoother and happier. Like a lot of other things, we do not realize the importance of etiquette. Until it starts to disappear. Gilbert and Sullivan. Gilbert and Sullivan are the authors of many lively and humorous operettas. These works are the most popular of their kind and are regularly performed today. But the two authors are known almost as well for their arguments and disagreements. The famous partners were very different people with very different interests. William S. Gilbert wrote the words that Sullivan set to music. Gilbert had a special talent for humorous verse. He loved puns and had a very quick wit. Personally, though, he was very businesslike. He had wanted to enter the military and always had the look of a soldier about him. He was fond of giving orders and disliked criticism of anything he did. Arthur S. Sullivan, on the other hand, was a sensitive, emotional person whose main interest was music. Sullivan came from a poor family, but his musical talents and good looks had helped him to succeed. Sullivan wanted to write serious classical music, but as a poor man, he needed a source of income. Sullivan also needed someone to direct him. On his own, he had trouble deciding what to do. Gilbert and Sullivan never became really good friends, and at the end of their lives, they had little contact with each other. But the writer and musician needed each other. Gilbert needed a composer who could enliven his writings for the stage. Sullivan needed someone to write a text for his music. Sullivan, who tended to be lazy, needed someone to push him. A theatrical manager named Richard Doyley Cart arranged their first collaboration. Gilbert visited Sullivan and read him his satire on the legal system, Trial by Jury. Sullivan loved the piece and quickly wrote the music. Trial by Jury was produced in 1875 and became the first triumph for the partners. Doyley Cart decided to form an acting company, which would stage future works by Gilbert and Sullivan. A string of successes follows: The Sorcerer in 1877, H.M.S. Pinafore in May 1878, The Pirates of Penzance in December 1878, Patience in 1881, Ireland in 1882. The Mikado in 1885, the Yeoman of the Guard in 1888, and the Gondoliers in 1889. In spite of these successes, the two partners were not happy. Sullivan did not like the way Gilbert dominated their relationship. Sullivan had to write music for Gilbert's scripts. Why couldn't Gilbert write words for Sullivan's music? 
Gilbert, on the other hand, thought that Sullivan got the most of the credit for the success of their operettas and that he was overlooked. Gilbert was the driving force in the relationship. He was always writing new scripts and taking them to Sullivan. It was Gilbert who rehearsed the actors and supervised the productions. Sullivan had little to do with the actual performance. He usually did conduct the orchestra on opening night. The amazing thing is how these two different people produced such wonderful work. Each separately had difficulty writing something that the public wanted. Together, they were unbeatable. Gilbert's sharp and often cutting remarks were made acceptable by Sullivan's beautiful music. Gilbert's satire might have made people angry, but Sullivan's music calmed them down. Even when the English people were the targets of Gilbert's criticisms, the audience went out of the theater humming these criticisms to Sullivan's music. Henry Ford. Some inventions are based on simple ideas or principles. Barometers are based on the idea that air has weight and pushes down on objects. A barometer measures this air pressure. Evangelista Terricelli invented barometers in Italy in 1643. Other inventions have taken longer to develop. The automobile has thousands of parts, and it took a long time to make a really useful car. Henry Ford was one of the first people to make a reliable automobile. In 1765, James Watt invented the steam engine. Within a few years, a Frenchman, Nicolas Cugnot, had built a steam-powered vehicle. These steam carriages were used in England in the 1800s, but they were big and slow. They looked like a train without the tracks. Most people preferred to travel by train. In Germany during the 1870s and 1880s, Nikolaus Otto and Gottlieb Daimler developed the internal combustion engine. This ran by burning gasoline. Another German, Karl Benz, built a gasoline-powered car. Around the world, there were many inventors trying to build a car that would be better than the one before. Some people thought that electric cars would become common. In the 1890s, several inventors working in the United States developed a gasoline-powered car that was practical for daily use. Henry Ford was born on a farm in Michigan in 1863. As a boy, he loved to take clocks and watches apart and reassemble them. Eventually, he went to work for the Detroit Edison Company. In his spare time, he worked on a horseless carriage, as the early cars were called. In 1896, he completed a car that ran smoothly. He later sold it and made another one. Since early cars were made by hand, they were usually quite expensive. Not only that, but when they broke down, there were no repair shops to take them to. One had to know how to repair a car oneself. Henry Ford tried to make cars which would be affordable and which would not break down very easily. His Ford Motor Company was formed in 1903 in Detroit, Michigan. Since many parts had to be brought together to make a car, Ford developed the assembly line. On the line, each worker would do one specific job. When the car reached the end of the assembly line, it was finished. In this way, many cars could be made in a single day. The result was that Ford was able to bring the price of cars down. Ford's Model T car was advertised as being as frisky as a jackrabbit and more durable than a mule. Since it cost hundreds rather than thousands of dollars, many ordinary families were now able to buy a car. Once many people had cars, their habits began to change. People didn't have to live next to the factories or offices that they worked in. Going for Sunday drives or traveling to tourist sites became a common thing. In 1905, a car drove across the United States and back again. In 1912, a car went across Canada from coast to coast. Soon there was public pressure for good roads, so that cars could travel anywhere in North America. Henry Ford was not the only inventor of the modern car. However, he was able to make a car that everyone could use and afford. John Chapman, American pioneer. When the first Europeans came to North America, they found dense forests coming down right to the shore. So thick were the forests that it was said that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River without once touching the ground. Clearing these trees to make room for fields and buildings was a very difficult task for the early settlers. Another difficulty was finding enough food in this new land. Many European crops could not grow in this climate. Carrying and storing seeds over a long period was also risky. 
Native Indians were often helpful in teaching the settlers how to find food, but sometimes there were no Indians nearby, or they were hostile. John Chapman is famous today because he helped the early settlers grow one important product: apples. Apples could be eaten fresh in the fall or stored through the winter. They could be made into fresh apple juice or alcoholic cider. They could be dried or made into applesauce. Apples also could be made into vinegar, which is very useful for keeping vegetables from spoiling. John Chapman was born in Massachusetts in 1774, the year before the American Revolution began. John's father joined George Washington's army to fight for American independence from Great Britain. While the war was going on, John's mother died. In 1870, John's father married again, and soon John had lots of younger brothers and sisters. John probably worked on his father's farm as he was growing up. Then he worked on neighboring farms. It may be at this time that John began to learn about apples. After the Revolutionary War, the population of the USA was expanding. Many Americans wanted to go west over the mountains to find land in Indian territory. In the fall of 1797, young John Chapman headed west to Pennsylvania. On his way, he gathered leftover apple seeds from the cider mills that he passed. As usual, John walked barefoot, but as he traveled, snow began to fall. He tore strips off his coat and tied them around his feet. Then he made snowshoes out of tree branches. When he arrived in the West, he began to clear land and plant apple seeds. This began a pattern that would last Chapman's whole life. He would travel ahead of the settlers, clear land, and then sell his baby apple trees to the settlers when they arrived. When the area became too settled, Chapman would move further west and start again. Many settlers regarded John Chapman as a strange character. He never bought new clothes, but wore whatever old clothes came his way. But he was always welcome at a settler's cabin. John was good at clearing land, telling stories, and growing apples. He liked children, and children liked him. He was a religious man and would read to the settlers about God and living together peacefully. At this time, there was conflict between the settlers and Indians about land. John managed to be friendly with both groups, but John did warn the settlers if the Indians were planning to attack them. Every fall, John went east to gather more apple seeds. He would then go farther west and find some empty land to plant his seeds. During the warm weather, he tended all his fields of baby apple trees. Once they were properly grown, he sold the seedlings to settlers. When he had earned enough money, he bought land to grow more apple trees. In his own lifetime, he became known as Johnny Appleseed. Legends grew up about him. It was said that his bare feet could melt snow and that he could leap across rivers. Johnny Appleseed never built himself a real home. He was a wanderer all his life, traveling west to Indiana and Iowa and back east again. He enjoyed sleeping outdoors, lying on his back, looking up at the stars, and thinking about God and His world. He died in Indiana in 1845, and no one knows exactly where he's buried. But all through that region are hundreds of apple trees. These apple trees are the most fitting memorial to John Chapman, the legendary Johnny Appleseed. Laura Secord. Women have often played an important role in war. They have worked in munitions factories, made clothing and supplies, encouraged and entertained soldiers, nursed the wounded, and acted as spies. It is rare, however, for a woman to have played a key role in determining the course of a war. Many people believe that Laura Secord played such a role in the War of 1812. Laura Secord was born in the United States at the time of the American Revolution. Her father had fought in the U.S. Army against the British, but when land in the American states became scarce, the family moved to Ontario, Canada, and so back under British rule. Laura married into a pro-British family and adopted their political views. So when the War of 1812 broke out between Britain and America, her husband James Secord joined the Canadian. Militia to defend Ontario against the Americans. The American invasion of 1812 was defeated at Queenston Heights, and some of the wounded were brought to Laura's house in nearby Queenston. Laura went out to the battlefield where she found her husband James, who was severely wounded, and brought him home.
In 1813, the U.S. invasion was more successful. Parts of Ontario close to the U.S. border were occupied by American troops. Local families were expected to provide room and board for U.S. officers. It was sometimes possible, therefore, for Canadians to overhear American officers discussing military strategy, either in their homes or in the local tavern. The situation in Ontario looked desperate. In the spring of 1813, the whole province seemed likely to fall into American hands. In June, Laura overheard talk of an American attack on the British outpost at Beaver Dams. Her husband was still suffering from war injuries, and she had to look after him and their children. Nevertheless, she resolved to go to warn the British commander. Possibly, Laura did not intend to walk the whole way herself. She hoped to be able to pass on the news to someone else along the way. First, she would have to make up a story to get past the American sentries. She left Queenston in early morning and walked 19 miles to the neighborhood of Beaver Dams by nightfall. She still had to cross a wide stream and climb up the Niagara Escarpment. There she came upon an encampment of Indians who were assisting the British. Their war cries in the moonlight terrified her, but she insisted on being taken to the British commander. Finally, one of the chiefs escorted her to British headquarters, and she was able to tell Fitzgibbon the American plan of attack. When the Americans arrived in the neighborhood of Beaver Dams, the Indians had prepared an ambush for them. A running fight ensued between the American force of 570 soldiers and 450 Indians supporting the British. At this point, Fitzgibbon arrived with 50 British regulars. Seeing the Americans disorganized and surrounded by the Indians, Fitzgibbon boldly demanded their surrender. By telling the American commander, Boatsler, that he was facing huge British and Indian forces, Fitzgibbon induced the American leader to turn over his whole army to the British. Although only small armies were involved at Beaver Dams, the battle had great significance. Afterwards, the Americans stayed behind their walls for the rest of the year. The U.S. government recalled their commander-in-chief. British and Canadian morale increased, and Laura's home in Queenston was restored to British control. Laura Secord's story was little known until 1860. She was an old woman in her 80s when she was presented to the visiting Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII. He awarded a gift of money for her services. Her story then became famous. Today, her home in Queenston, Ontario, is an historical museum and a popular tourist attraction. Mutiny Mutiny is a word that has brought fear to the most powerful empires in the world. Mutiny is when soldiers and sailors refuse to obey their commanders, often killing or imprisoning them. Mutiny can spread through whole armies and navies, throwing governments into crisis. No wonder that nations have always taken harsh measures to punish mutinous leaders. The ancient Romans executed every tenth man from an army unit that had mutinied. In the British Navy, mutineers were normally hanged. However, one of history's most famous mutinies did not happen to a whole army or navy. It happened on a single small ship, the HMS Bounty. HMS Bounty set sail from England in December 1787. It was a small, cramped vessel, uncomfortable during a long voyage. Its goal was to sail to the South Pacific and bring back Tahitian breadfruit plants. The government hoped that breadfruit would provide a cheap food for black slaves in the British West Indies. The captain of the Bounty was William Bly, a veteran of many voyages. His crew, however, was largely made up of inexperienced young men. There was no room on the ship for soldiers or marines, so Bly, as the only commissioned officer, had the difficult task of maintaining order. After a long and difficult trip, the bounty finally arrived in Tahiti in October 1788. 
Free from the constraints of life aboard ship, the young men enjoyed life on the tropical island with the friendly natives. Many of the sailors established relationships with island women. Meanwhile, the collection of breadfruit plants for the homeward voyage continued. In April 1789, Captain Bligh decided that it was time to return to England. The breadfruit plants were loaded on the deck, making the ship cramped indeed. The bounty set sail and would no doubt have reached England again, except for the turmoil in the mind of one of its young officers. Fletcher Christian was 24 years old, of dark complexion, and from a good family. As the bounty pulled further from Tahiti, Fletcher seemed to have decided that he didn't want to return to England. Tahiti had been an earthly paradise, and now long months of discomfort aboard ship awaited him. He was too far from Tahiti to return by himself. He would need the bounty. On April twenty eighth, seventeen eighty nine, some of Fletcher Christian's friends seized control of the ship. Captain Bly and eighteen sailors who supported him were put in a small open boat with limited food and water. Meanwhile, Christian and his twenty four followers sailed back to Tahiti. Eventually, Fletcher Christian would sail the bounty to the uninhabited Pitcairn Islands, far to the south of the shipping lanes. Meanwhile, Bly and his loyal followers sailed in their open boat almost the width of the Pacific Ocean. They suffered from thirst, hunger, and sickness, as well as hostile natives. Finally, they reached Timor in Indonesia in June and eventually made their way to the capital, Batavia. When they returned to England, Captain Bly was first greeted as a hero. Soon, however, public attitudes changed. The legend began that Bly was a cruel tyrant who had caused the mutiny by harsh treatment of his men. Although Bly had a temper and was not very tactful, this does not appear to be the whole story. In fact, it is the controversy over who is to blame for the mutiny: Bly or Christian. That has kept the story alive for more than two hundred years. Peggy's Cove, Nova Scotia. Why do people travel hundreds of miles to look at beautiful scenery, and why does one particular place attract many more visitors than similar places not far away? Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia, Canada, is one of those special spots that draws people from all over the world. It is hard to explain its special charm, but anyone who has been there will know what I am talking about. The southern eastern shore of Nova Scotia possesses many picturesque fishing villages and many beautiful seascapes, but one doesn't have to go very far from the capital city of Halifax to see this special spot. There are no trees around Peggy's Cove. The dominant feature are huge, round granite rocks, many of them the size of houses. They seem to be pushing up and out of the land and sea. Nestled inside the circle of these rocks is a group of fishing huts. Now and then, a fishing boat leaves by the little bay or cove in order to travel out into the great Atlantic Ocean. For nearly two hundred years, there have been fishermen at Peggy's Cove. All around the little harbor, there are huts or fish stores where the fishermen do their work. Here, they bring in the fish and clean them, wash them, and salt them. The salted fish are then stored in barrels. Nowadays, however, more fish are sold fresh than salted. Visiting as a tourist, I wandered into one of these little huts while the fisherman was busy at his work. He explained to me that although Peggy's Cove is a tourist destination, it is also a working fishing village. The fishermen get no money from the tourists, but have to take the time to talk to them and explain their work. There are, however, some tourist shops and tea rooms in the vicinity. Part of the charm of Peggy's Cove is that it is so small. The population has been well under one hundred people for most of its history. The buildings are mostly small dwellings, with the lighthouse being the most prominent structure. A good variety of fish are caught in the area, including mackerel, herring, haddock, cod, and halibut. Lobsters are also trapped nearby. However, because of overfishing, 
catches have declined in recent decades. The plants and animals of the area are also of interest. Showy purple lupins grow close to the ocean. They thrive on salty ground, and the closer they grow to the spray of the ocean, the better. One of the world's few carnivorous plants, the common pitcher plant, also grows around Peggy's Cove. Its leaves trap insects, which are digested to nourish the plant. Common birds are the stately blue heron, which likes to fish in the marshy pools. The heron stands several feet high and spear fish and frogs with its sharp beak. Another bird is the osprey or fish hawk. The osprey's keen eyes can spot a fish moving beneath the surface of the water. It can dive swiftly, hitting the water with great speed, catch the fish in its claws, and then fly away with its catch. I have also seen pools close to the ocean, full of large tadpoles. These tadpoles spend several years in the water before they develop into bullfrogs. Bullfrogs, the largest Canadian frog, have been known to eat baby ducks and small fish. Looking over the little harbor and out toward the great ocean, one notices the contrast between the very small and the very large. If Peggy's Cove were larger, it would be more ordinary. As it is, it represents all the little fishing villages where men have gone forth in little boats to fish on the wide ocean. Public transit. Public transportation in North America varies greatly from place to place. Some large cities like New York, Boston, Toronto, and Montreal have subway systems. These same cities usually also have train service into the city. But most towns and cities do not have subways or trains. Some do not even have buses. Most big cities have some sort of public bus service. In most North American cities, people who use the buses complain about poor service. This is partly because most people prefer to drive a car. Automobile companies spend billions of dollars on advertising. They want to convince young people that they should drive a car as soon as they are old enough. Even when public transportation is very good, most North Americans prefer to drive cars. So mostly students, poor people, and seniors use buses. The large car companies have a lot of economic and political power in North America. They can usually convince politicians to limit the money put into public transit. Lobbying by large car companies has been effective in closing down many railway lines. In some cases, large corporations have bought train tracks and torn them up so that no one could use them again. Because of this, nearly all transportation in North America is by car. Bus or truck. The automobile created the modern North American city. Cars allowed families to live outside the city and drive back into work. Since the 1920s, large numbers of Americans have lived in the suburbs and used cars to do nearly all their daily activities. People drive to school, to work, to the shopping mall, to the theater. To church and to doctors, lawyers, and dentists, because the modern city is so spread out, it is difficult to get where you want to go by walking or even by bicycling. But the automobile also causes problems. Car accidents are a major cause of death and injury. Crowded streets and snarled traffic can lead to road rage. Frustrated drivers sometimes get out of their cars to fight each other. Young people often use cars as super toys. They enjoy driving very fast and take risks while driving. A high proportion of serious accidents concern drivers using alcohol or drugs. More recently, some people have accused cell phones of being a cause of accidents. About half of the air pollution in North American cities is caused by motor vehicles. The exhaust fumes from cars and trucks are part of this. The other part is that vehicles erode the surface of the highways. Small particles are torn loose from the road and thrown into the air as cars whiz by. Heavy trucks are particularly large contributors to particle pollution, especially in hot weather. A layer of smog covers many cities. Much of this is caused by motor vehicles. Because city roads are often crowded, the result is frequent traffic jams. When cars are moving very slowly, bumper to bumper, it adds to air pollution.
Another problem with cars is that not everyone can afford one. The average car costs nearly twenty thousand dollars to buy and about four thousand dollars a year to operate. So cars are also a status symbol. People with cars tend to move out of the city. As a result, downtown areas are usually where the poorer people live. For a long time, many people have said that governments should try to make downtown areas more attractive to live in. This would include improving public transit into and inside the cities. Then some people may move back from the suburbs, and air pollution levels will decline. Right now, the large automobile companies and oil companies oppose these measures. Recently, there have been cuts to public transit in many cities. Whether these cuts continue or whether they get reversed is a big political issue in North America today. Romance novels. Novels are imaginary stories about people and events. They are written to entertain and amuse. Two thousand years ago, Greek writers told tales of young lovers. Usually, the lovers were separated by terrible events and were reunited only after much hardship and suffering. This plot idea is still in use today. The most popular books for women today in North America are romance novels. Many millions are sold every year. This means that romance publishing is big business and very competitive. Companies survey their readers to determine the kinds of stories they like. One survey asks readers whether or not they would like more references to sex in their novels. Usually, romances are about love, not sex. But in today's market, publishers are ready to give their readers what they want. The essence of the romance is to create suspense by putting obstacles in the way of lovers. One simple obstacle is to make the hero and the heroine as different as possible. For example, an Eastern school teacher meets a Western cowboy. Of course, at first they don't like each other at all, but in time they fall in love. Or a female social worker might meet an aggressive businessman. Quite often, the heroine is a spinster who has sworn never to marry, or perhaps she has a special dislike for the hero and his family. The romance writer must come up with a plausible way to bring the two together. There are a number of popular plots that lead to marriage. Sometimes the heroine, out of a sense of duty, will move in with the hero to help him raise his children, or she may be a professional nanny who moves in with a widower. A favorite plot is the marriage of convenience. Two people who don't like each other get married for financial or political reasons, or for the sake of the children. Later, of course, they fall in love. In most cases, there is some particular obstacle to marriage. Often, either the hero or the heroine already has children, and he or she doesn't expect that anyone will want to take on their ready-made family. Sometimes, one or the other has a physical disability, or is of a different race, class, or background. For example, the heroine may come from a very strict and proper family, while the hero may have a dubious reputation or even be a criminal. The interest of the story lies in how these very different people come together. Usually, the hero is a very masculine type—a cowboy, engineer, military man, pirate, gambler, etc. The heroine is usually very female, but may have tomboy or spinster traits. She frequently has a strong personality and a temper, and is described as feisty or fiery. A good example of the two types is Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Nearly every romance novel will contain some promotional offer to encourage readers to order more books. Romances can be addictive, and some women read them almost nonstop. Some romances are very well written, but the majority follows a set formula. That way, the reader always knows what to expect. Stephen Foster, American songwriter. Before radio and television, movies and recordings, entertainment was often a family or community matter. Someone in the family could play a musical instrument, or a neighborhood musician would play for small gatherings. In addition, there would be traveling groups of musicians, actors, and clowns who would go from town to town. In 19th century United States, one of the most popular forms of entertainment was the minstrel show. Black slavery was still permitted in the southern states until 1865. Even after that date, the lives of many blacks working on large farms or plantations did not change much. They did hard physical labor in the fields, had little control over their lives, and very little time to relax with their friends. Foster, who was born in 1826, made this situation the background for many of his songs. White musicians would try to imagine the feelings of black men and women working on the plantations. They would write songs in the dialect or speech patterns that they thought black slaves used. In these songs, the black people would be talking about their hardships, falling in love, playing music and dancing, 
And finally, growing old and dying. White performers would blacken their faces and sing these songs to white audiences. They would play musical instruments like the banjo, a small four-string guitar, which black people played often. As a small boy, Stephen Foster had sometimes been taken to a black church by his family's black servant, Olivia Pies. Here, he first heard the melodies that inspired his own songs. Only a couple of Foster's songs are based directly on Negro spirituals. But many of his songs have the natural simplicity and emotional power of folk songs. The youngest member of a large family, Foster showed his musical talent at an early age. He played the flute, violin, and piano. Growing up in an energetic business family, Stephen was expected to become a businessman, and for a while he worked as a bookkeeper. All his spare time, however, was spent writing songs. Foster attended minstrel shows and tried to get the performers to sing his songs. Sometimes the performers would steal his songs and publish them under their own names. Copyright laws were weak and rarely enforced, so some music publishers would just go ahead and publish a song without paying the songwriter. Since Foster hoped to make a living as a songwriter, this was a problem. Foster's first hit song was "Oh Susanna," published in 1848. It became popular with the thousands of men from all over the United States who were heading west to the California Gold Rush of 1849. Unfortunately. As an unknown songwriter, Foster received no money from his early songs. He seems to have given them outright to the music publishers just to establish his reputation. Foster's name, however, was soon widely known, and in 1849 he was able to afford to give up bookkeeping and marry the daughter of a Pittsburgh physician. During the next five years, he earned a moderately good income from songwriting. In 1851, a daughter Marion was born. Foster wrote many of his best-known songs at this time: "Old Folks at Home" in 1851, "My Old Kentucky Home" in 1853, and "Jeanie with a Light Brown Hair" in 1854. Difficulties in Foster's marriage began fairly soon. These may have been partly due to his strange work habits. He spent days locked in his room working on his songs. Then he would rush out with his materials to the local music store, presumably to test out the songs on his friends. He also became more and more addicted to alcohol. Eventually, his wife and daughter left him. Foster died alone in a rooming house in 1864. Immigrants to the United States brought their traditional folk songs with them. However, there are very few typically American songs. Foster provided many songs that express the life of 19th-century USA. His songs were easy to sing and were popular with nearly everyone. In a sense, Foster helped to create roots for American popular music. Thanksgiving Day. Thanksgiving Day has a special meaning for Americans. Many holidays were brought along from Europe by the early settlers and didn't change very much. But Thanksgiving takes on a special shape in North America. That is because of the Thanksgiving celebrated by the early Pilgrim settlers in Massachusetts in 1621. These early settlers were from England and they were known as Puritans. This is because they wanted to purify the state religion of England. They felt that the churches were more concerned with politics and customs than God and worship. They were also called pilgrims because they were willing to travel to other countries in order to worship God the way they wanted to. When the English government put some of the pilgrims in jail, the rest left England and went to the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, they could have their own churches. However, it was hard to earn a living there, and at first, they didn't know the language. In time, the English king learned where they were and tried to have them arrested. So they thought of another plan. Pilgrim leaders like William Brewster attempted to raise money to start a colony in North America. They would have to borrow money and pay it back later. Thirty members of the Pilgrim Church in the Netherlands voted to sail to America with their families. They returned to England and set sail on two ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. When the Speedwell appeared unable to cross the ocean, both ships returned to England. All who still wanted to sail crowded into the Mayflower and set sail on September sixth. 1620. Many of the passengers became sick during the long voyage, and some died. They encountered fierce storms because they were sailing late in the season. After 66 days, they sighted the sandy shoreline of Cape Cod in present-day Massachusetts. There was disagreement between the Pilgrims and others on board ship about what to do. So first, they had to agree to a common form of a government and elect a governor. Since winter was coming, they decided to stay on the ship till spring. About half of the remaining settlers died during the first winter. When the Mayflower sailed back to England, only about 50 settlers were left. Nearly half of these were children. 
There were Indians in Massachusetts, but at first they were not friendly. They shot arrows at the settlers. But one day, a friendly Indian named Samoset came to visit them. He spoke English and could tell them many things. He brought another Indian named Squanto, who showed the pilgrims how to plant corn. Eventually, their chief Massasoit came, and he promised to keep peaceful relations with the settlers. All spring and summer of 1621, the pilgrims worked hard in the fields. They also finished building houses and barns. In the fall, they were delighted to see that the corn and vegetables had grown well. They decided to have a Thanksgiving feast and invited their Indian friends. On the day of the feast, Chief Massasoit came with 90 Indians. There were turkeys, deer meat, and fish to eat. The feast lasted three days. When the food ran low, the Indians went out to shoot more birds and animals. The pilgrims and Indians competed in races, wrestling, shooting, and other games. The pilgrims addressed prayers and thanks to God for providing food, shelter, freedom of religion, and friendly Indians in this new land. Ever since 1621, Thanksgiving celebrations include memories of that special occasion. Today, turkeys, cranberries, corn, and squash are usually part of the Thanksgiving meal. In the United States, Thanksgiving Day is a national holiday. It's celebrated every year on the fourth Thursday in November. In Canada, where the harvest is earlier, Thanksgiving is celebrated on the second Monday of October. The celebration always includes giving thanks for the good things that people have received, especially for food and families. Along with this goes the Thanksgiving meal, when so many good things are eaten. The expulsion of the Acadians. The history of the Americas, from their discovery by Columbus till the founding of modern nation states, has been the struggle among European powers for the largest and richest sections of the continents. In particular, England and France have struggled for control of most of North America. Many tragedies and disasters have marked this conflict, but few have been as heart-rending as the expulsion of the Acadians in 1755. Acadia refers to what are now the maritime provinces of Canada: New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia. In 1605, a French expedition under De Monts and Champlain established an agriculture settlement at Port Royal in present-day Nova Scotia. Although Port Royal and other colonies had very mixed success. There was a gradual increase of French settlement through the 17th century. By 1710, the French or Acadian population had reached 2,100. In 1710, Port Royal fell to the English, and the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 confirmed British ownership of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. By this treaty, the Acadians, that is the French-speaking inhabitants, were allowed to stay or leave the country as they pleased. The majority of inhabitants of Acadia were French and were still being influenced by agents from France and Quebec. This made their loyalty to Britain very doubtful in time of war. Governor Phillips attempted to get the Acadians to swear an oath of allegiance to King George of England, and Phillips was able in 1729 to get the French settlers to agree to a modified oath, with the understanding that they would not have to fight against the French and their Indian allies. The Acadians remained neutral during the fighting between Britain and France in 1744. To 45 in Nova Scotia, in 1749 the British established a new capital for Nova Scotia at Halifax and began to bring in English-speaking settlers. Because of threats from the French and Indians, most of these settlers remained close to Halifax. British skirmishes with the French and Indians continued, and a new war between France and England was approaching. Governor Lawrence decided that it was time to settle the Acadian question. He ordered the Acadians either to take an unqualified oath of allegiance to England or to face expulsion from the colony. At that time, in 1755, there were troops and ships from New England in the area, and it seemed like an opportune time to round up the Acadians and ship them out. When the Acadians refused to take the oath, which might oblige them to fight against France, the British rounded up 6,000 of the 8,000 Acadians, burned their homes, and shipped them away to British colonies of Virginia, the Carolinas, and as far away as the mouth of the Mississippi River. Several of the transport ships sank, drowning all on board, and the Acadians died from disease and hardship. Since the expulsion order did not come from London. It has been suggested that Governor Lawrence had personal reasons for the expulsion. It may have been greedy for the land and possessions confiscated from the Acadians. Others say there was the genuine fear for the English position in North America, and that Lawrence was only protecting the interests of the colony. Acadians still live in maritime Canada today. Almost 2,000 fled into the woods and eluded the roundup. Another 2,000 Acadians later returned from exile to take the oath of allegiance. Many stories were told of their sufferings. 
One tale relates to how, on the very day of his wedding, a bridegroom was seized by the British and transported from the colony. His bride wandered for many years through the American colonies, trying to find him. At last, when she was old, she found him on his deathbed. The shock of finding him and his death soon caused her death. This is the story of Henry W. Longfellow's poem, Evangeline. The Great Walls of China. The Great Wall of China is famous in North America, and many tourists would like to travel there. However, most North Americans don't know very much about Chinese history. That is changing now, as China is becoming an important subject for study in the West. The settled communities of China were targets for nomadic raids since earliest times. For much of its early history, China was not fully unified. However, Shi Huang, who died in 210 BC, united the whole country. Then he set about defending China from the northern nomads. It seems likely there have been defensive walls in the north before. However, Shi Huang had a wall constructed across the entire north of China. This defensive wall extended for almost 2,000 miles and had 25,000 towers. Such walls were very expensive to build. They also required huge numbers of men to construct them and later to defend them. Even so, the Great Wall did not stop nomadic invasions altogether. Not long after Shi Huang's death, a tribe called the Huns crossed the wall. The emperor Hu Ti, who expanded Chinese power beyond the wall, defeated them. Centuries later, the Mongols to the north of China were united under Genghis Khan. The Mongols attacked China, and Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis, became the first non-Chinese emperor of China in 1279. Eventually, the Chinese rebelled and overthrew their Mongol rulers. Nonetheless, the Mongols remained a threat. In 1449, they destroyed a Chinese army and captured the emperor. A new Great Wall was begun to keep the Mongols out. This is the wall which tourists visit today and which is pictured on Chinese stamps. Construction continued for 200 years. While some parts were built off packed earth, much of the wall was built of stone, brick, and rubble. This is why it took so long. Stones had to be quarried and bricks baked and carried to the site. Laborers, peasants, soldiers, and criminals were forced to work on the wall. Large and small forts and watchtowers carefully guarded the wall. Nearly a million soldiers were stationed along it. The Chinese defenders lit fires when the enemy was sighted. Plumes of smoke and cannon shots told that the enemy was advancing and how many there were. By 1644, the new wall was almost completed. That same year, however, an internal uprising overthrew the emperor. This revolt was partly caused by the high taxes demanded to pay for the wall. The emperor's men invited the nomadic Manchu tribe to come through the gates in the wall to help put down the revolt. The Manchus came, but they stayed and ruled China for several hundred years. Since the Manchus ruled both north and south of the wall, they did not care about maintaining it. Many parts fell into disrepair, and some completely disappeared. Today, the parts that remain are a major tourist attraction. The Great Wall of China is one of the wonders of the world, even if it really didn't succeed in its purpose of keeping the northern nomads out of China. The Planetarium. All around the world, stargazing is a popular activity. The night sky lit up with stars is one of the most impressive scenes in nature. Besides its natural beauty, people study the night sky for many reasons. Some believe that they can read the future in the stars. Others think that the stars influence the weather, while some people worship the stars and the planets. There is a problem with stargazing. If the night is cloudy, people on the ground cannot see the stars. Also, bad weather makes being outside at night uncomfortable. Besides, not everybody wants to stay up late at night. A planetarium is an ideal solution to all these problems. A planetarium is usually a large dome-covered building. It has seating like a theater. The program here is a star show. A special projector throws a picture of the night sky on the ceiling of the planetarium theater. Like a movie projector, the planetarium projector can show a constantly changing program. It can show how the stars look right now, how they looked thousands of years ago, and how they will look in the future. Planetariums can be both entertaining and educational. School children can go to learn about the nine planets of the solar system or about the various groupings of stars. Planetariums can teach you how to find the stars and planets yourself when you're out at night. There can also be dramatic showings about changes to the universe over time. This is also a way to view special phenomena like Halley's comet, which only appears once in a lifetime.
Planetarians can also show how ancient people view the skies. Shepherds living out under the sky imagined that groups of stars represented wonderful people and huge animals. Stories were told about these constellations. Sometimes the story explained how the people or animals became stars. For example, why Orion, the mighty hunter, is chasing Taurus the bull. Planetarians can project these figures on their screen. They can also speed up changes in the heavens. It takes about 28 days for the moon to travel through all its phases. Changes in the moon or in the sun can be shown easily. Planetarians can also show the sky the way it appears in another part of the world, or the way it appeared on a famous historical occasion. Special heavenly phenomena, such as a meteor shower, can also be demonstrated. Things that appear only rarely in the real sky can be shown every night. A planetarian is usually concerned to put into special programs to keep its audience coming back. Since the heavens are always moving and changing, there is no shortage of ideas for programmers. The story of Anne Frank. War, persecution, and economic depression affect not only adults but also old people, children, babies, the sick, and the handicapped. Since history is written mostly about politicians, soldiers, intellectuals, and criminals, we don't read very often about how events affect ordinary people. Now and then, a special book will shed light on what it was like to live in the midst of terrible events. Such a book is the diary of Anne Frank. Anne Frank was born in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, in 1929. Her father Otto Frank was a businessman who moved the family to the Netherlands in 1934. In Amsterdam, Otto started a company selling pectin to make jams and jellies. Later, he began a second company that sold herbs for seasoning meat. Otto Frank had decided to leave Germany because of the policies and personality of the new German Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Hitler had a personal hatred not only for Jewish people but also for everything Jewish. He felt that one way to strengthen Germany and solve its problems was to kill or drive out all the Jews. Hitler also felt that other groups such as blacks, gypsies, the handicapped, homosexuals, and a chronically unemployed should be eliminated. Then only strong, healthy, true Germans would be left. Since Hitler had a plan to solve Germany's economic problems, he received a lot of popular support. Very few Germans realized that he was mentally and emotionally unbalanced and would kill anyone who got in his way. The Frank family was Jewish, and they felt that they would be safe in the Netherlands. However, in May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands and soon took over the government. In 1941, laws were passed to keep Jews separate from other Dutch citizens. The following year, Dutch Jews began to be shipped to concentration camps in Germany and Poland. Just before this began, Anne Frank, Otto's younger daughter, received a diary for her 13th birthday. Less than a month later, the whole family went into hiding. Otto Frank had made friends with the Dutch people who worked with him in his business operations. Now these friends were ready to help him, even though hiding Jews from the authorities was treated as a serious crime. Behind Otto Frank's business offices, there was another house that was not visible from the street. Here, the Franks moved many of their things. Only a few trusted people knew they were living there. The Franks moved into these small rooms on July 6, 1942, and they lived there with another Jewish family, the Van Pels, until the police captured them on August 4, 1944. So, for more than two years, the two families never went outside. All their food and supplies had to be brought to them. During this period, Anne Frank told her diary all of her thoughts and fears. Like any teenage girl, she hoped that good things would happen to her, that she would become a writer or a movie star. She complained that her parents treated her like a child. She insisted that she was grown up. She also talked about how difficult it was to live in a small area with seven other people and not to be able to go outside. She wrote about the war and hoped the Netherlands would soon be liberated from the Germans. Anne sometimes envied her older sister Margot, who was so much more mature and who never got into trouble. She and Margot wrote letters to each other to pass the time, and even had a romance with Peter Van Pels, who was seventeen. Then all their fears came true. All the eight Jews hiding in the house were arrested and eventually sent to Auschwitz death camp in Poland. Although the war was ending, it did not end soon enough for the Frank family. Only Otto Frank survived the war. One of their helpers, Miep Gies. Saved Anne's diary and kept it. After the war, Otto Frank decided to publish it. Since 1947, more than 20 million copies had been sold in 55 languages. Anne's diary shows the terrible cost of hatred, persecution, and war better than any history. Christmas holidays. 
In many ways, Christmas is the most important holiday in North America. It is the most important commercial festival. Most retail stores do half their annual business in the six weeks or so before Christmas. Christmas is an important holiday from work and school. Many workers take the whole week off between Christmas and New Year's Day. It is the biggest time of the year for parties, gift giving, home decorations, and visiting. Many homeowners compete to see who can have the best display of lights. It is also an important time for the entertainment industry. Many Christmas movies, TV shows, recordings, concerts, and plays are produced every year for the Christmas season. It is also the time of year when the largest number of people attend church, because Christmas is a religious festival too. It celebrates the birth of Jesus. How all these different things came together to become Christmas is a long story. Why, for example, is Jesus' birthday celebrated on December twenty-fifth? No one knows the exact day that Jesus was born, but Jesus was born during the Roman Empire, and for the Romans, December twenty-fifth was a very important day. The Romans had many gods and many religions. Two religions, both of which had one main god, were the worship of the Invincible Sun and Mithras. These gods were both honored on December twenty-fifth. Because December twenty fifth was just after the shortest day of the year, it was a natural time to worship the sun. December was also a time to celebrate the end of the agriculture year. The Romans held one of their main festivals, the Saturnalia, beginning on December seventeenth. That lasted for a week. The Romans also began the custom of celebrating New Year's Day on January first. So the last half of December and the beginning of January was a wonderful time for partying and games. The early Christians didn't know what day Jesus was born. At first, they celebrated his birthday on January sixth. However, as most people in the Roman Empire were becoming Christians, it was decided to move the date to December twenty-fifth. The celebration lasted twelve days until January sixth and took the place of all other festivals. That way, people who were used to celebrating on December twenty-fifth would feel more comfortable. As different peoples became Christian, they brought their own customs to be part of Christmas. The people of Northern Europe used evergreen trees and mistletoe as symbols of spring and eternal life. The evergreen tree became the Christmas tree. The mistletoe is hung from the ceiling at Christmas for couples to kiss under. It was also in Northern Europe where the idea of Santa Claus or Father Christmas began. In Roman times, there was a man who became known as Saint Nicholas. He is said to have given gifts to the poor and provided dowries for poor girls who wouldn't otherwise be able to marry. The idea of the gift-giving saint became joined with the northern idea of spirit of Christmas festivities. It was a poem written in 1831 by the American writer Clement Moore, which popularized Santa Claus throughout the world. Twas the night before Christmas. Told the story of how Santa visits every house in the world on Christmas Eve and brings toys for good girls and boys. Since that time, parents have secretly bought toys for their children at Christmas. When the children awake on Christmas Day, they find toys by the chimney or under the Christmas tree. They are told that Santa Claus and his reindeer brought them. Adults also give gifts to each other at Christmas time. No wonder that the stores sell so many things then. It is often said that Christmas is becoming too commercialized. In the rush to get everything ready, to buy the gifts, decorate the house and tree, give parties, visit family and friends, and attend special Christmas events, the original reason for celebrating is sometimes forgotten. Only when people go to church or sing Christmas carols or attend musical performances about Jesus' birth do they remember that Christmas is the birthday of Christ. Helen Keller. What would it be like to be unable to see anything, hear anything, or say anything? Life for young Helen Keller was like that. She had an illness before she was two years old that had left her deaf, dumb, and blind. After that, it was difficult for her to communicate with anyone. She could only learn by feeling with her hands. This was very frustrating for Helen, her mother, and her father. Helen Keller grew up in Alabama, USA, during the 1880s and 1890s. At that time, people who had lost the use of their eyes, ears, and mouth often ended up in charitable institutions. Such a place would provide them with basic food and shelter until they died, or they could go out on the street with a beggar's bowl and ask strangers for money. Since Helen's parents were not poor, she did not have to do either of these things. But her parents knew they would have to do something to help her. 
One day, when she was six years old, Helen became frustrated that her mother was spending so much time with a new baby. Unable to express her anger, Helen tipped over the baby's crib, nearly injuring the baby. Her parents were horrified and decided to take the last chance open to them. They would try to find someone to teach Helen to communicate. A new school in Boston claimed to be able to teach children like Helen. The Kellers wrote a letter to the school in Boston asking for help. In March of 1887, a teacher, 20-year-old Ann Sullivan, arrived at the Kellers' home in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Ann Sullivan herself had a very difficult life. Her mother had died when she was eight. Two years later, their father had abandoned Ann and their little brother Jimmy. Ann was nearly blind, and her brother had a diseased hip. No one wanted the two handicapped children, so they were sent to a charitable institution. Jimmy died there. At age fourteen, Ann, who was not quite blind, was sent to the school for the blind in Boston. Since she had not had any schooling before, she had to start in grade one. Then she had an operation that gave back some of her eyesight. Since Ann knew what it was like to be blind, she was a sympathetic teacher. Before Ann could teach Helen anything, she had to get her attention. Because Helen was so hard to communicate with, she was often left alone to do as she pleased. A few days after she arrived, Anne insisted that Helen learn to sit down at the table and eat breakfast properly. Anne told the Kellers to leave, and she spent all morning in the breakfast room with Helen. Finally, after a difficult struggle, she got the little girl to sit at the table and use a knife and fork. Since the Keller family did not like to be strict with Helen, Anne decided that she needed to be alone with her for a while. There was a little cottage away from the big house. The teacher and pupil moved there for some weeks. It was here that Anne taught Helen the manual alphabet. This was a system of sign language. But since Helen couldn't see, Anne had to make the signs in her hands so she could feel them. For a long time, Helen had no idea what the words she was learning meant. She learned words like box and cat, but hadn't learned that they referred to those objects. One day, Anne dragged Helen to a water pump and made the signs for water, while she pumped water over Helen's hands. Helen at last made the connection between the signs and the thing. Water was that cool, wet, liquid stuff. Once Helen realized that the manual alphabet could be used to name things, she ran around naming everything. Before too long, she began to make sentences using the manual alphabet. She also learned to read and write using the square hand alphabet, which was made up of raised square letters. Before long, she was also using Braille and beginning to read books. Helen eventually learned to speak a little, although this was hard for her because she couldn't hear herself. She went on to school and then to Radcliffe College. She wrote articles and books, gave lectures, and worked tirelessly to help the blind. The little girl who couldn't communicate with anyone became, in time, a wonderful communicator. A favorite place. It is good to have a favorite place where you can go to be alone and relax. Sometimes this spot is your own room or a quiet part of the house. Sometimes it is somewhere outdoors, away from people and busy streets. Or you may feel most comfortable in a shopping mall. Or a downtown park. Our favorite place is especially nice to go at times of stress, when work gets too hectic, or we have trouble with other people. Then our favorite place is a refuge from these difficulties. My special spot is very close to where I work. It is on a busy university campus. At one end of the university, hidden among several buildings, there is a pond. This pond is surrounded by large rocks. Which rise up like a small cliff on one side. Shooting out of these rocks are water pipes, which create a small waterfall. The water is drawn up from the bottom of the pond and drops back into the middle. This keeps the water from becoming stagnant. On the other side of the pond, there is a grassy shore and a flat stone patio. Here, in the summer, people can sit out and have meals. Yet very few people come here to sit, perhaps because they are very busy with their work. There is something very calm and pleasant about trees and grass and shade, about birds singing and water rippling, and flowers blooming all around. Green is a relaxing color for the eyes. Still water suggests peace. 
Running water seems full of life. There's a large weeping willow tree on the grassy side of the pond. Its branches touch the water and shade much of the pond. Rushes grow in the shallow water. The pond is only about three feet deep. In the summer, there are beautiful water lilies in bloom over much of the pond. Sometimes I have counted over thirty blooms, and some flowers are over five inches wide. Goldfish and minnows are the pond's chief inhabitants, but there are also crayfish and other animals. At different times, there have been a turtle, a water snake, and a family of ducks. Behind the pond is a large glassy wall, which reflects the entire scene. One can also go inside and view the pond, even on rainy or snowy days. There are several gardens close to the pond. One of the gardeners told me that he could turn the waterfall off and on. Usually on the weekends, it is turned off. But if there is a special event, the waterfall is left on. Behind the glassy wall is a cafeteria. Here, visitors to the university are sometimes taken for meals. The students do not use it. In the winter, the pond freezes over. Sometimes, if the winter is very cold, the pond freezes right down to the bottom. Then most of the goldfish and minnows die. Usually, some survive in the mud at the bottom of the pond. Occasionally, people will skate on the pond if the ice is smooth. When spring comes, a lot of the old rushes and water lily leaves from the previous year are cleared away. This makes the pond more attractive and gives the new plants room to grow. If there are too many rushes, they are sometimes cut down in summer. Then visitors can see the water lilies better. Chances are that if you ever visit Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, you will hear about Pond Inlet. And if you come in the summer, you will probably see me there, thinking about my next article. Colonial Williamsburg. Travelers in the desert or the jungle sometimes see the remains of old cities. These cities were once large and prosperous, but something has changed. Perhaps the climate got drier or wetter. Perhaps the trade routes, which had brought merchants to the city, now went elsewhere. Perhaps enemies destroyed them, or perhaps disease or famine drove the people away. Other cities, which were once important, have become less so in time. Jamestown, Virginia, the first English colony in America, is now only an historic site. It began as the capital of Virginia, but when fire destroyed the government buildings in 1699. The capital was moved to nearby Williamsburg. Williamsburg was an important town for many years. The British governors lived there, and two of them worked on the plans for the town and its buildings. The College of William and Mary was established there in the 1690s, the second oldest college in America. As the capital, Williamsburg contained many public buildings, including a courthouse, a jail, a powder magazine, the governor's palace. And the government building, of course, there were many private houses as well. From 1699 until 1780, Williamsburg was the capital of Virginia. Many people came there for government and legal business. It was also a social center with dances, fairs, horse races, and auctions. The governor and his wife provided expensive dinners and entertainment for their guests. Most of the important people in Virginia owned tobacco plantations. In 1612, John Rolfe had first raised tobacco to sell to England. Soon, tobacco farming was Virginia's most important business. Most planters were able to build large houses and buy slaves to do their work. One plantation owner is said to have owned 300,000 acres of land and 1,000 black slaves, as well as having large amounts of money. The planters were the leaders of this colonial society, and they resented British interference in their local government. When England imposed taxes on the American colonists in 1765, it was a Virginian, Patrick Henry, who spoke against them. His words, "Give me liberty or give me death," helped to inspire the American Revolution. As complaints about British rule increased, it was Virginians who led the rebels. George Washington became commander of the Revolutionary Army, and Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence in 1776. 
In 1780, the capital of Virginia was moved to Richmond. Williamsburg was now simply a small college town of local importance. Not much changed in Williamsburg for many years. In the 20th century, the Reverend Dr. Goodwin, who was the priest at the Williamsburg Church, had the idea of restoring Williamsburg to the way it appeared in colonial days. Goodwin approached John D. Rockefeller Jr. with his idea, and Rockefeller agreed to finance this project. Beginning in 1926, the old buildings of Williamsburg were restored to their original form. First were the college buildings, then the Rally Tavern, the government building, the governor's palace, and so on. Buildings that had been destroyed over time were reconstructed from plans and descriptions. Soon the restored buildings were open to the public. Guides, dressed in 18th century costumes, show visitors through the buildings and gardens. Visitors can also travel to nearby tobacco plantations. Now, tourists who pay admission to visit this wonderful historic town finance much of the work of restoration and conservation.